The 50s, the dress and the music, the politics, personality, pictures and stories of the time are still large in South Africa's memory. It was like a rebirth of an era. Um, it inspired the people of South Africa. The new outlook, the new ideas emerged. The new spirit among the people generally was brought about by the 50s. This was so exciting, it was like a, like a romantic saga, political saga for me, you know. It's true that one mustn't be romantic about politics too much, but at the same time, I think it's good that one has that sort of optimistic concept. There was movement to the cities and in the cities. There was a sense, a feeling that things might happen for everyone. Politics was on the boil. With Dr. Malan's National Party in government, the young men of the ANC Youth League were arguing for a shift to more militant, decisive action. Among these men were Lembede, Mda, Tambo, Sisulu, Mandela. We began, you know, to read uh, literature and uh, to be able to see what had happened in countries like India, what was happening in the rest of Africa, like Nigeria, Ghana. We must realize that from now on, we are no more a colonial, but a free and independent people. We now began to feel that the same thing should happen in our country, that uh, the organization should now go out into the highways and organize the masses of the people. We believe that the time has come for the emergence of a mass organization, a um, development which the leadership did not welcome. The Youth League brought into the ANC the concept of a radically different approach and that there must be a program of action the program of action must incorporate uh, all uh, methods of mass action, civil disobedience, boycotts, strikes. These were all things which more or less horrified the uh, leadership of uh, those days uh, who thought this was uh, extremist and radical. The ANC Youth League was formed on a platform of uh, very strong African nationalism. Uh, and among the things, of course, they did not believe in uh, was uh, cooperation with other organizations, organizations of Indians, colors, whites, and especially uh, cooperation with the Communist Party. The Youth League's opposition to leadership from non-Africans came to a head on May Day 1950. The Communist Party, the Indian Congress and the executive of the Transvaal ANC organized a regional stay at home to protest against the banning and restriction of political leaders. May Day was opposed um, by the Youth League because uh, they regarded May Day as 
a communist orientated fair. And the opposition was quite strong. Uh, uh, by strong, I mean, uh, at times it was physical, uh, where they tried to break up meetings and uh, pull people off the platforms and so forth. In spite of the differences, the strike virtually stopped all industry except mining on the Witwatis run. But in the evening, police opened fire, killing 18 people. The death sent shockwaves through the townships. The ANC, this time with the support of the Youth League, Communist Party and the Indian Congress, planned a day of mourning. It was to be South Africa's first national stay-at-home strike and was called for the 26th June 1950. There was a lot of pride in the fact that we had participated in the first national strike uh, organized in South Africa. The strikes of 1950 were a clear signal that the new youth leadership of the ANC were carrying out the program of action. This commitment to mass action was the culmination of the movement in the ANC from moderation to militancy. Despite this, the Nationalist Party government tightened and extended all forms of racial segregation. In 1950, they passed a barrage of bills, the Population Registration Act, the Group Areas Act, the Suppression of Communism Act, and the Unlawful Organizations Bill laid the foundations of social and political apartheid. People say, what is this? Dr. Malan says, this is apartheid. Apart means one thing, that you will be there, not here. So the thing started to change. Hence, the concept now of defiance campaign came in. My task was to ensure that uh, there were volunteers for the defense campaign because uh, we, following uh, the non-violent policy which was observed in the Indian Passive Resistance Campaign, we had uh, to train volunteers and to make sure that uh, the actual act of defiance was not uh, influenced by Ashanti provocateurs which would enable uh, the uh, government uh, to drown the country in bloodshed. On the 26th of June, 1952, we will defy. We will select six laws. We will defy, we will go to jail on our own. Among those laws, group areas were there, pass laws, limitation of stock. They were among those six. And on that day, the fight. In the morning of that day, which was the first group came from this, from this area, and I led that 30 of us, you know, and we went through the Europeans' only entrance in the railway station here in Port Elizabeth. That was the first group which went into action that morning. And uh, a number of people thought that we are going to be shot as we enter. And that is why there was a, a church service the whole night, praying very hard that we shouldn't be shot down. Fortunately enough, we were not shot. I myself, I must confess that uh, I thought that in fact we were going to be shot. That is why I had to run down to my parents uh, in Fort Beaufort to tell them that they shouldn't be shocked if this happens. And of course, they said, well, what can I do? You better go. We got 800 people that signed on the volunteer to defy. And uh, 124 people went into action the first day. They defied at the post offices and the railway station. We were 
went uh, to Boxburg, and the person who was supposed uh, to start the campaign was Comrade Walter Sassoon. We were going to enter Boxburg uh, location without uh, getting a permit. What uh, the police did then was uh, to block, to lock the gate uh, to the township. And uh, we gathered there, and the volunteers, you know, uh, stormed the gate. And eventually, uh, the police opened the gates and arrested them. <laughs> Well, we were singing, chanting, you know, the do-doing, you know, those days do doings <laughs> So um, we sang, and uh, there were about 39 of us. The, the, the prison authorities were really confused. They were so excited, they didn't know what to do. They had no cells prepared for us because it seems to me that that prison uh, accommodated only for male prisoners. People just came out. They broke the law. <laughs> The ordinary men were saying, now we are defined, we are now fighting. In some families, two people defined, three people defined. So that now it became actually the, the, the beauty of, of the fight against the government. When we were given by the magistrate two weeks in prison. But the magistrate was puzzled. I suppose he never heard of people just breaking the law, going to jail voluntarily. And uh, he just didn't know what to do. 30 days for me as a leader, 15 days for the rest in jail. It was a campaign in which various national groups participated. There were Africans, there were so-called coloreds, there were Indians, there were whites who took part. Only after the defiance campaign that the United Nations declares that racialism in South Africa is contrary to the U Charter of Human Rights and is a, uh, a threat to world peace. For 8,500 people to be arrested uh, at the time in 1952 was no small achievement. The defiance campaign inspired thousands to join the ANC. Swelling paid up membership from only 7,000 before the campaign to 100,000 by the end. The government reacted with a series of raids, arrests, bans and trials aimed at restricting the scope of protest and immobilizing many of the campaign's prominent leaders. But the scale and success of the campaign had failed to deflect the government from its course and won little sympathy from the white electorate. In 1953, J.G. Stradom was elected the new leader of the Nationalist Party. But now, in fact, he is already the next Prime Minister. Prime Minister, what is the government trying to do with its policy of apartheid? Apartheid, or separation to use the English equivalent between black and white, has been the traditional policy of both the English and Afrikaans-speaking people in South Africa for centuries. Its object is to regulate life between black and white, to eliminate friction between the two groups and to ensure the safety of the white minority, whilst at the same time providing scope uh, for the development of the uh, Africans in their own territories and in separate townships in the white man's area. Under Stradom's leadership, the Nationalist Party won the 1953 general election with an enlarged majority, thanks in part to its exploitation of white fears aroused by the defiance campaign. The ANC had also elected a new leader in December 1952. Chief Albert Dutuli faced his first three-year term of office with little hope that the government would ease pressure on opposition political activity. There is no evidence that the nationalists are in any way slackening. On the contrary, I think that they are intensifying their implementation of their policy. But we are entering 
a phase when now they have got to carry out their policy more and more, which of course means uh, greater oppression when they now carry out uh, policies. Hendrik Fervut, Minister of Native Affairs, piloted the Bond Education Act through Parliament. There must be separate development for the Bantu on the one hand and the European on the other. It means, therefore, that in the course of time, we should separate the uh, spheres of influence and of work of these two racial groups. That will take a very long time, but we set our foot on that uh, road, and in the course of time, we brought about to the advantage of both groups. There is no possibility for you as a black person to enter what uh, Dr. Fatfoot used to call the green pastures. You know, the green pastures were for the whites only. And you know, there is a saying in Africans, kafir sablay mar kafir. You remain where you are, in other words. Fervut believes that if we are we, we, we get the child in the classroom to accept domination, to accept a subservient position in society. They will in turn, the school children, spread it amongst the community. And in the final analysis, the whole African population will accept subservience. We announced a campaign for the boycott uh, of schools. And the question was never asked what was going to happen after the children had boycotted the schools. We thought that as an executive, it should be a limited boycott for um, a week. But the people at conference, um, as, as you can imagine, people like so-and-so and so-and-so, and, so and, so, and wanting to be militant, they thought this was too mild. Permanent, uh, what's it called, um, boycott was necessary. Now, permanent boycott, when you made no preparations for that, was harmful. In my own area where I was in Port Elizabeth, we had 8,000 
uh, children who were boycotted uh, schools. And then everybody came to my house and said, and now what? And I frankly had no answer to that question. And it's a question that had been asked by the teachers quite a great deal. And we had poo-pooed their questions at mass meetings and so on when they tried to ask. People had uh, poured scorn on the uh, teachers for asking that question. The most uh, successful areas in fighting bando education were those that uh, not only opposed bando education, but who established alternative schools and uh, so that uh, the children could be withdrawn from the Bandu education schools to schools which were now established by the movement. But uh, most of us uh, concentrated just in opposing uh, Bandu education without establishing alternative schools. To that extent, we made a mistake. There were weaknesses in our work. The government acted, which you must always anticipate what the government reaction is going to be. Government acted immediately by banning even a house meeting where education was to be uh, given. And um, I think, therefore, we were not adequately prepared for it. There, it was the biggest chance we have ever had, because it appears that um, even unlike the past laws, every parent was opposed to Pandu education. Inspired by its successes, the government continued with its legislative program of racial segregation. The government has now passed an act called the Native Resettlement Act, in which they want to shift 60,000 people who already have houses because they're living in an area which the Europeans don't like them to live in. It's a fantastic situation. Sophia Town's very existence was a defiance of apartheid plan. It was one of the few freehold areas where Africans could own land. A vibrant mix of races and classes, a hive of cultural and intellectual activity. It was everything apartheid dreamt about dismantling. Now one must understand the situation in the freehold areas such as Sofata, where the township was owned by landlords, Chinese landlords, white landlords, uh, African landlords, Indian landlords. They owned the properties. And they were charging absolutely exorbitant rents. I mean, it was in those days five pounds a bed. Then the government was extremely clever. They built houses at Meadowlands first. So you had houses, tarred roads, water, everything, and at one pound something a house, or two pounds a house. So we didn't distinguish between the interests of the tenants and the interests of the landlords. So it tore the community apart. They didn't say so. They attended the meetings. They attended the huge demonstrations. But in fact, inside, there was this uh, uh, conflict. We introduced a slogan such as, we shall be moved of our dead bodies. That was not quite correct. It's not, it was not based on the assessment of the situation. It was a feeling of people who felt that they were indignant about the removal. Uh, they were angry, therefore, and uh, it was merely an expression of anger, as the situation showed when it came up, when the actual day came. We were not able to resist, because when uh, you talk like that, you, you mean you're prepared to meet force by force. That situation was not being prepared for.
as uh, we were trying to resist uh, the removal of Safar Town, I made a speech there in which uh, I uh, called for a departure for a non-violent struggle, a violent struggle, because uh, a non-violent struggle, I felt, was futile under those conditions. But uh, it was a speech, you know, which uh, was a bit uh, on the reckless side, which had not been uh, properly discussed, uh, you know, by the executive, not even by my close colleagues. <clears throat> it was an angry speech, not a well-considered uh, policy statement. So I was wrapped on the knuckles uh, by the national executive quite directly. general atmosphere was you know, that there was uh, it was stiffening up it was it was uh, the laws that were introduced were becoming more and more draconian you know in concept but at the same time we felt therefore that it was necessary to have campaigns to offset this sort of thing and to bring the people up to a higher form of struggle and that is why we uh, uh, agreed upon having this Congress of the People. In 1953, December Conference, the ANC comes up with the idea of a Congress of the People, right? It takes on. The Indian Congress welcomes it. The Congress of Democrats gets established. Had it been established, they come, come in. In 1954, we organized the Women's Federation, right? In 1955, Saktu. So it's a continuous upward movement of the people participating in the struggle. There was a broadening of um, approach, the question of knowing we are now dealing with a situation where we must mobilize all people, black and white. These are the ideas which led to the Congress of the People which, uh, when it was called, you included even the Nationalist Party to come along, something like you have today. We called everybody like Odessa. Those are the ideas which developed there. A National Action Council representing the ANC, the Indian Congress, Colored People's Organization, and the Congress of Democrats organized a campaign to collect people's demands and grievances throughout South Africa. There were a great deal of preparation. The door to door, coming into a house, telling the people what you intend uh, doing, collecting uh, 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 demands, which is uh, the highest uh, 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 way of exercising democracy. That campaign was intensive. That campaign was also extensive. We reached out to people in areas which had not been touched before. It was very hard work and, you know, we did not have a sophisticated machinery that we have today to reach out to the people. We used to, we used to actually walk by foot. We go, go to the area by bus, of course, now to reach the homes we used to go by foot. They were simple people, they had nothing, you know, there was nothing for them to boast about. They never had any luxury. What they cooked for the day, they offered it to you to eat with them. Now, to the extent that some homes, they used to make that, or what do you call that, the, the, the beer, you know, in, in, in that kaba you know, that uh, pumpkin shell. And it is to be really beautiful, it'd be a nice and cool and, you know. They used to offer that to us before we start our discussion. That was in place for, for tea. So the cowboy is to go around and you've got to drink it in a special way so that the tips don't go down your throat and so forth. So these are some of the things that, you know, we used to 
enjoy uh, with people. And mind you, you just can't just go and say, well, can I just come in and just walk in and so forth? No, you've got to wait till the elderly gentleman comes out and says, yeah, sabwa. He says, sabwa. Right, now Moses Mabida, my comrade who passed away, he'll start the conversation. Say, now we came for this and we came for that. One policeman said that the ANC government, African policemen, the ANC government must demand the equal uniform, not separate uniform. We are wearing khaki uniform. The white people wearing a different uniform. Uh, the ANC government must please and give the police a similar uniform to everybody. I mean, those things, I couldn't say that I can write this thing. I wrote it down. We wrote it on pieces of paper at the back of cigarette boxes, you know, that were clear, and so on. So that we really covered vast areas in various groups. We had to explain, look, this is not an easy process. What we are trying to do is to create a new type of constitution. Or we want to meet at this very big meeting and we want to put all our demands there. And at this big meeting, they will decide how to do it. So then they agreed. So on that basis, they say to us exactly what they felt was needed. And immediately, the first thing is that we need land. We need better houses. We need better schools. Our children need to be educated in a better way, and so forth and so on. Those were all the demands that were made. And there were thousands of them, thousands of them, all over. And every delegation that came carried their banners, carried their placards, and their flags, and so forth. And you could just see all over, you know, delegates from all parts of the country. Based on the collected demands, the Freedom Charter reflected the broad vision of a future society. It declared that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and that no government can justly claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people. This big size cop, I forget his name, he came up on the podium. And he takes his time and he grabs a mic and he says, Burdoms, you're all under arrest, you know, the way he announced over the mic. God, the whole thing, everybody froze, you know. Just wondering who the hell this guy just comes and takes over. He doesn't even ask the chairperson for any permission. Because he's the police, he's the law of the land. He just, oh, you're under arrest. Don't move. Everybody sit down. And everybody sat down. What can we do? And the tension at that stage, you know, it was so sharp that he, uh, uh, the slightest provocation, and they could have opened fire on us. But they... You know, we saved the day by somebody, I forget the lady's name now, she came up to the stage, she says, Comrades, please don't panic. Don't do anything. This is the hour of, the hour of our discipline. And if we were taught any discipline, we will remain quiet. Let's go into scene. And then she started, Kosi Sigileli. And I tell you, the beauty and the thunderous you know, rhythm of that song kept everybody ended in a disciplined way that nobody did anything. We just, just let the cops do what they wanted to do. Nobody moved, nobody provocated the police, nothing of the sort. And, 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 and those guys just couldn't do, the, they couldn't do a thing until they said, this fellow came and said, right now, all of you have got to go to the front and hand your dockets in, give your names and addresses and so forth. So then uh, just prior to that, of course, the Freedom Charter was adopted. The Freedom Charter again gave great uh, impetus or a, a, a variation, not I shouldn't say a variation, but more than that, a, a feeling, a confidence that that is what we need and what we want. So it was a great, a very important factor in development of our movement. And also the non-racial character of the Freedom Charter. You mustn't forget it. So you see, what the ANC is today was actually being formed or 
like, like a baby in a womb, you know, developing to maturity, to birth. It was coming up all the time, from one movement to another, growing. <laughs> Abusing of passes against women, they saw the, what the passes meant to their men, and I broke up their homes. Now they would be taken away from the home for a, making, having a crime of not having a pass, and that definitely affected them very strongly. We know exactly from our brothers, from our fathers. How bad is a pass law? Because when we walk in the street, especially in the morning, we're going to school, we find the queue of the people being arrested at the bus terminus. We'll find them arrested in the street. We'll find the policemen searching them and all. These people not mean they were criminal just for the pass laws. So that way we come to realize if we're going to accept the pass law, Without battle and fight for the past law, we're going to be the same thing our, our men for. If you take the pass, they're going to tell us nicely that, oh, you can go everywhere when you like to go. You can go overseas. You can go to everywhere. But it, it is not going to be like that. We decided that the conference of the women, the Federation of South African Women, too much against, uh, too much to Pretoria to protest against the past. When we go to Pretoria, our best song, it was say, Go see what we need, I'm a volunteer. Go see what we need, I'm a free Go see what we need, I'm a volunteer. I think there were about over 20,000 women. We filled the whole, that whole place there at the Union buildings. It was all green and black. Mind you, the grass there is green, but you couldn't see the grass. We only saw the uniform. We selected the five people to take the petition inside. And we had the appointment. The leaders had the appointment with Strato. But in fact, when we went there, they say he was not available. Lillian Ngoi went inside and she stood up inside with, she lifted her arm up with her feet like that. She said, What tint of a fuzzy, what tint in Bogotu, Zaugufa. And she sang the song, she said, Strato, what tint of a fuzzy, what tint in Bogotu. That song from that day, it came to be a favorite song for the woman until today. We didn't only have demonstrations in, in the Pretoria. We had demonstrations in Cape Town, demonstrations in Johannesburg, in Devon, everywhere else. So the people felt very sore, hurt, and they felt that they must come to the fore to defend their homes, to defend their children. So that the fight against the past laws was not just a mere against a scrap of paper, but what the past loss meant in the lives of the people. Now is the time for, for a policeman to the woman and a woman to the policeman. That's where we hit them. We hit them with our fists. So they hit us with the stick. So another woman, I can't remember that who was that one. He fell down and then we start to go to this, this policeman when they hit us and we hit them back and we just take the stones and we throw the stones to them and then after that they arrest us. I 
I can't tell the spirit there. What that is that, that, that time? We filled all the small police stations from Hilbro, Jappy. We were so full there. They were so, you know, they couldn't work. The prisoners, they couldn't do anything because we filled the whole place for two days. They had to throw us, some of us out. The anti-pass campaign sparked waves of women's resistance. Reacting against oppressive local conditions, women stood their ground. In Cato Minor, outside Durban, police raids on illicit beer brewers infuriated women. They resented the fact that it was illegal for them to brew liquor while the municipal beer halls profited from the men. The women were provoked by the administration department, so they mobilized against the beer hall. When the manager came and addressed the women, there were thousands of women was addressed to the ground of the beer hall. They did, did not agree. So we were giving only five seconds to disperse, otherwise the police would shoot. At five seconds, the policemen fired to the women. The buses of cooperation were start bending right through in the street. The buses were hijacked to go everywhere where there is beer hall in Devon. Anything at beer hall was dis destroyed and it was closed down for two months. I thought Alexander was the real place. The real place is the, in, in, in spite of the fact that they call it Dark City. In 1957, when there was the Alexandra Bus by Court, the people of Alexander Township decided not to pay uh, an extra penny for their fare uh, uh, from, from Alexander to Johannesburg. Well, you would think that a penny was nothing. What was a penny? A penny went a long way during those days. You could buy a candle for a penny, you could buy a box of matches for a penny, a tomato or an onion for a penny. And then we were not even consulted as uh, the people who support PIPCO. So we decided at a Its campaigns during the 50s, the Nationalist Party government consolidated power. While the ANC organized, campaigned, and marched, the special branch conducted raids in an effort to uncover evidence of subversion. These raids culminated in the early hours of December 5, 
1956 with the arrest of 156 Congress leaders. The arrest took place on the 5th of December 56, and there was a great indignation about this type of arrest. And it was clear to the people that it was nothing else but the suppression, a brutal dictatorship of the Nationalist Party. I was then arrested in the early mornings of the 5th of December. Uh, by a chap called uh, Warren Officer Rousseau. And there uh, were just the two of us. And I say to him, what gives you the courage you not know, to take me alone? Um, do you know that I can overpower you and escape? And he says, uh, Mandela, I don't like your joke. I say, it's not a joke. He says, look, I'm, I'm armed, I'm carrying a revolver. I say, my friend, that that revolver is as yours as it is mine. Do you know that I'm a boxer? Oh, he was very much uh, upset. And uh, when we went uh, to my office, he was very nervous. But I assured him that, no, I'm joking. Uh, it's just a joke. But uh, he didn't like the joke at all. That is how I was arrested. Well, I think the strategy was obviously to uh, nip in the bud the, uh, the, this movement that I'm talking about, to demobilize it, to take the 156, we were 156 major leaders from all the sectors, uh, get them tied into a trial over years and years uh, in the hope that uh, this would hold back the upsurge, the mass upsurge, which was uh, in evidence. And they used uh, the Freedom Charter as the basis for the allegation that the African National Congress had uh, entered into a conspiracy to overthrow the government by force and to establish a uh, a socialist state. That was their allegation. The day that, that we were brought to court from the Johannesburg fort uh, and the opening of the treason trial, there was a treason cage. You know, they had set up a, uh, uh, a sort of a cage right around the drill hall inside, and we were, the accused were to sit inside. It was an amazing thing, and, and, and of course, on the lighter side, there we were. 156 of us in a cage, uh, mainly African, but the sprinkling of whites, coloreds, Indians, um, from every group in the country. And uh, one of the ch alternative charges against us, and this caused a lot of birth, was a charge of that we were creating hostility between the races. And here, this was the only occasion in the whole history of South Africa where black, white, coloured, Indian, were together seated in alphabetical order in a dock in South Africa. Far from intimidating the people, it influenced the people. The people be be began to believe that now we have the leadership. The professors and churchmen, the lawyers, workers, it had the effect of uniting. And uh, you felt pleased to see the spirit which Emerged there. The treason trial dragged on for four years until March 1961 when the accused were finally judged not guilty. By the end of a decade in which huge numbers of South Africans of all races had shown their resistance to the systematic introduction of apartheid, the government's policy of harsh retaliation was beginning to make it difficult for the ANC to continue leading a non-violent struggle. But at the end of the 50s, I think there was a feeling of frustration that, you know, we so what, we'd gone into strikes, we'd got a, a freedom charter, we'd had a defiance campaign, we'd had continuous bus boycotts, um, anti-pass campaigns, but apartheid was still in the saddle. And it became obvious that we must now search for new ways of challenging this regime. As the campaigns were being run during the 50s, 
the leadership was always saying the ANC is going to be banned. Let us.